Hi everyone, um, good to have you here on our seventh, is it? Seventh week of our course. Please correct me if I'm wrong. I don't know how to count things anymore at this point of whatever this is. Is it a lockdown? Is there a crime? I don't know. Anyway, um, today we will start or we will continue our conversations on biopolitics that we have had uh, throughout the past few weeks. But today we will finally dive into really like one of the core, very core subjects of this course, which is um, the question of population control and the relationship between colonial structures of power and technologies of birth control and um, population control and all of that. So, um, to, to start a little bit, so um, in the past few weeks we have uh, kind of going, we have been going through different aspects of biopolitics, which is uh, kind of a fundamental touchstone of this course, understanding how the, the control over life um, is like really this fundamental, um, this fundamental aspect of the exercise of colonial power. So, um, in order, I guess, to continue the, this interrogation on, on biopolitics and these reflections on, bio on biopolitics, as I said, um, today's class will be perhaps a little bit different because I'm not going through, I'm, gonna, I'm not going to go like specifically or directly um, into the papers that we've seen. I'm not going to engage them in like a very direct or obvious way. But I'm going to tell you, it's going to be more of a storytelling thing. I'm going to tell you the story um, behind the, the, um, the hormonal contraceptives that we have nowadays. And this is hopefully going to tie together uh, some of the reflections that we've had throughout the past weeks. So um, one very interesting thing, I guess, uh, that we could start with um, and that I mentioned, I think, briefly in previous classes. Um, yeah, perhaps let's go back to our second, was it, class when, uh, when I, I talked about the relationship between science and, uh, and coloniality. So the hormonal contraceptives that we have nowadays, and that means the birth control pill um, and uh, pretty much like any, any medication that uses or that, that um, any contraceptive that uses hormone, hormones. Um, one thing that, that uh, one of the first things that I realized when I started researching that a few years ago and that really interested me and it really got me into uh, this subject was when I figured out um, through, through the work of Paul Preciado, which uh, we discussed a couple of weeks ago, was that hormonal contraceptives were specifically designed, the ones that we have nowadays, were specifically designed to suppress naturally occurring androgens and uh, to, uh, to reduce body hair and acne and to shape this uh, ostensibly female, right, uh, body to to the set of standards that um, that defines acceptable expressions of femininity. So, when this was a, to me kind of a mind blowing uh, uh, thing, because I and I guess as a lot of people, I had no idea that the effects, many of the effects of the hormonal medications that we have nowadays were not kind of side effects or, or something um, that kind of ended up happening if you, you produce a medication like that, but were things that were engineered into those medications, specifically made to be like that. Um, so it's interesting to think of that, and I'll, I'll tell you a little bit more about that history. This is just like a a short initial comment, but um, what is interesting to me is that, uh, or that um, maybe maybe we can start talking about, is that 
the deployment of hormones as a strategy for this homogenization of bodies is actually a, a historical matter. And that it's something that reaches back um, to the beginning of the 20th century, to the beginning of the past century, when a new field was beginning to emerge in medicine, endocrinology. And this, again, is something that we, I think, mentioned um, on our class about coloniality and science. So the identification of sub substances in, in the human body that regulated the operation of a number of bodily functions the reproductive system amongst them triggered a significant significant shifts in how science understood the relations between body and sexuality and reproduction. Uh, Nelly Oudshorn, which we also mentioned uh, um, a few weeks ago, uh, in that book that I told you about, uh, Bodies That Matter? No. Oh my god, I, I forgot the name of the book, but anyway. The book of, on the history of hormones. I am terrible. I forget the names of things. Um, but in that book, Nelly Althorn traces uh, a genealogy of body parts that were successively associated by the med biomedical sciences with um, the, let's say, the essences of femininity and masculinity starting from the gonads, going to testes and ovaries, and leading up to the discovery of hormones and the subsequent emergence of endocrinology as a field of research in the early 20th century. Now, it's interesting to note that these were not the only body parts to undergo a process of sexualization. Althorn remarks that, and this is a quote, that by the late 19th century, medical scientists had extended the, the sexualization to every imaginable part of the body, from, and from bones to brains. And, uh, and I guess, again, here we could uh, go back and think to, um, and think about Schiebinger, uh, Londa Schiebinger, which we also mentioned previously, Sylvia Winter and Alexander Wehelie, who remind us um, that the construction of subjugated bodies is validated through hegemonic epistemologies. So, um, gonads, ovaries, testes, and finally hormones being considered uh, or becoming um, seen as the seats of uh, femininity and masculinity, to use a term that Althorn uses, um, was a way to, to epistemically establish and sediment the, the idea of gender difference. Now, two pharmaceutical companies like Organ on Biosciences, which was established in the Netherlands in 1923, the identification of hormones hinted at the birth of a promising new market of preparations that could potentially be used to treat a wide array of illnesses from menstrual disorders to menopause and infertility. Now, obtaining hormones at the time was not an easy task, actually, however. In the first stages of research, progesterone and estrogen were extracted from animal gonads. Later, they were extracted from the urine of pregnant mares. Both of these methods required the use of an enormous amount of raw matter, um, which was, of course, a considerable logistical and financial inconvenience for companies interested in the mass production of hormonal preparations, interested in this potentially new market, right? And uh, I guess, like, figuring out how to get, like, tons of mare urine, I guess it wasn't a very good task or something very convenient to do. Um, but, however, after 1938... Um, the situation started to, to change, finally. In this year, in 1938, um, a U.S.-American chemist 
called Russell Earl Marker invented this chemical reaction sequence that allowed him to extract progesterone from the plant steroid and let, let me read this because it's it's a very difficult name to read uh, from the plant steroid sarsapogenin I did it I made it um, so the the technique that um, that Russell Marker developed which is known to this day as the marker degradation, was at first used to extract progesterone from a root, um, a root called Beth root, a plant belonging to the lily family. Uh, but he also used uh, a Japanese yam belonging to the Dioscoria family, which was rich in diosgenin, which was a type of sapogenin. Remember that the name of the plant steroid was uh, that uh, progesterone was extracted from is sarsasapogenin. So yeah, um, I am not good in chemistry. So uh, neither plant, however, was cheap or easily obtainable, right? So Marker was aware of this of the potential of this discovery but he needed to find a suitable, cheap, and more plentiful source of the compounds belonging to this uh, sapogenin class in order to be able to uh, make his, uh, his process, his chemical process, um, actually commercially applicable. So, by the early 1940s, Marker finally found his source. Wild Dioscoria yams, commonly found in southern Mexico. The first plant used to extract hormones was a root known in its native regions as, and this is a, a pretty terrible name, um, Cabeza de N-word, which I guess... Uh, even the way that, uh, that this was called already tells us uh, quite a bit. So Marker was able to, to synthesize from, um, from this root an impressive 2,000 grams, 2 kilos of progesterone from the yam. And soon after, Marker found business partners to uh, start his venture in uh, Emerick Somlo and Federico Lehmann. Um, one was a Hungarian-American physician and investor, and the other was a German chemist. Somlo and Lehmann were veterans of the pharmaceutical industry, and uh, they recognized the potential of Marker's work. In 1944, the three, uh, Marker, Lehmann, and Somlo, established established Syntax SA, which was described as a Mexican company devoted to the industrialization and production of progesterone. Less than a decade after it was founded, Syntax had become the largest supplier of synthetic hormones to pharmaceutical companies in Europe and in the Americas. Syntex changed the landscape of hormone production dramatically. Historian of science Gabriela, Lo Gabriela Sotolaveaga reports that because of Marker's discovery, the price of progesterone dropped to less than $1 per gram from nearly a $1,000 per gram figure. However, the search for an ideal source of this raw matter was far from over still. Throughout the 1940s, uh, La Vega reports, the jungles of Mexico continue to be scored for diostenin-rich uh, plants. By the end of that decade, an even better alternative had been identified, Barbasco, uh, whose scientific name, Linnaean, in Linnaean classification, is Dioscorea composita. Uh, this was a yam that, while also a Dioscorea, it took less time to mature, uh, 
contained more diostrogen and was believed to, found, to be found in inexhaustible abundance in Mexico's jungles. Um, and this, sorry, this was a, a quote from La Vallada. So, of course, the demand for Barbasco after this was found out, the demand for the, the yam sword, and the economy of the regions in Mexico where this plant was abandoned changed in response to that. Economic insecurity and scarce possibilities of employment led large numbers of campesinos, both adults and children, to start working in the honestly very arduous task of collecting this yam. And taking advantage of the situation, Syntex was able to establish a large network of workers dedicated to the extraction of this raw matter. La Vega remarks also, and this is very, very significant, very important too, that these workers were frequently kept in a state similar to that of indentured servitude by the Barbasco buyers, uh, known as acopiadores, uh, in a practice known as enganchar. So after this root was collected in the jungles of, of Mexico, of um, southern Mexico, it would still need to be processed before being shipped. And the laboratory is responsible for synthesizing um, the hormones paid the, company, the, the campesinos not only for the quantity of their product, but also for its quality. So in response to this financial incentive, local workers, uh, which were known as chalanes, began to develop their own processing techniques, actually, in order to extract higher percentages of diogenin from the plant. And yet, and this is also very interesting to us, the knowledge that, that, these, um, that these workers had was often questioned by foreign scientists. La Vega illustrates this dynamic by uh, citing the case of a U.S. American botanist who believed that rural Mexicans, and this is a quote, could not follow proper scientific methods because greed or self-importance clouded reason. This botanist did not even trust the ability of Mexicans to correctly report on the number of yams identified in the region. And yet, the method that he describes for, for counting the roots is incredibly similar to that described to La Viaga by a Mexican Barbasco trader in an interview. So these, this that I just uh, described here were at the very, very nascent stages of something that would later become known as the Mexican Barbasco trade. And it's interesting to me that it displayed such a profound biopolitical division of labor amongst the actors involved in the extraction of progesterone. The U.S. American and European scientists who worked for Syntex, as demonstrated by, by La Vega, perceived Mexicans as charming but incapable of undertaking serious scientific work. Um, an image that affected how labor at every step of the process was, and this is a, a quote also, sorry, um, how labor at every step of the process was evaluated and remunerated by the drug companies. The knowledge of native workers was understood by the foreign scientists to be rooted in traditions. Their judgment, as so vehemently expressed by this botanist quoted by La Viaga, was seen to be clouded by emotions. Sounds like a bit of a stereotype. So it's interesting that this brings us perhaps back to uh, one of the very first things that we discuss in this class, which is, um, which is Castro Gomez, um, that we, or 
yeah, earlier in this class where we discussed this uh, distinction between modernity and tradition, which posits that colonized nations and peoples are, are, are primitive and that colonizers are the sole owners and distributors of scientific knowledge. And, and it's interesting how this, this, um, this uh, observation is so clear when we look uh, at this early stage or this early history of hormonal contraception. So the division of labor, and again, we go into questions of labor, right? The division of labor established in the Barbasco trade determined that workers in these poor uh, rural and it's important to note indigenous areas where Barbasco grew wild would, would offer the physical and very demanding physical labor necessary for the collection and initial processing of the root. But the intellectual labor would be carried out by scientists in Syntex's laboratories. And this division of labor, and this is something very interesting that we're going to um, observe perhaps or, or discuss uh, throughout uh, today's class, is that this division of labor resonates throughout the history of birth control. Uh, those subjects coded as less valuable have been repeatedly exploited as objects of research, and the results of this exploitation ultimately is used for the benefit of those subjects coded as more human, more valuable. So it's, uh, I think perhaps now um, with knowing this, knowing uh, already a little bit about these first stages of the history of hormonal contraception, we can perhaps um, continue looking into, into the history now of specifically the birth control pill in order to continue identifying these biopolitical mechanisms that to this day also inform practices or policies related to birth control, population control, fertility management, and so on and so forth. So now let's talk a little bit about what I what I like to call the birth or the birth of the pill. So in let's go back a little bit. Right now we're in the 1940s already, right, with the Barbasco trade and everything. Let's go back a little bit to 1921 when an Austrian gynecologist um, Ludwig Kabeland was the first to describe how the transplant of ovaries from pregnant animals into non-pregnant animals rendered the latter temporarily sterile. Although Haberland's experiments, um, he, he did these experiments and that of course um, offered some insight into how hormones secreted by ovaries could be potentially involved and reproductive processes. And uh, again, let's, let's remember at the time, uh, um, endocrinology was an extremely new field and hormones had just started being studied, being studied right? So let's try to, to uh, imagine it from that perspective. So of course, these experiments offered immense contributions to, to I guess, the expansion of or, or the understanding um, of knowledge of uh, human reproduction, right? And yet, um, in order for this kind of research to continue, it was also necessary that certain social and cultural perce perceptions about birth control um, still uh, shifted and still changed. In fact, I mentioned this because at the time, disseminating information about contraception was actually illegal in many U.S. states, for instance, until well into the 1960s. Pharmaceutical companies like Syntax or Organ and Biosciences and, and Searle had been researching ways of synthesizing steroid hormones for years in hope 
of guaranteeing a spot in this potentially lucrative new market. But this research was undertaken, however, because of these laws. This research was often undertaken under, um, undertaken under, what a terrible sentence. Um, this uh, research was often carried out under um, the excuse of treating other issues, such as menstrual disorders or menopause or infertility. Uh, Norethisterone, I am, I am going to have to say so many weird names throughout this class, please forgive me. So norethisterone, um, which was um, the first commercially viable steroidal progestin uh, developed by Syntex, was, um, was first synthesized by uh, Carl Gerassi, Luis Miramontes, and George Rosenkranz in the company's Mexico City laboratories in 1951. Soon after that, Dr. Frank Colton synthesized another steroidal progestin, norethinodrel, um, at Searle in 1952, so very close to one another. Now, let's go somewhere else right now. In March 1951, so around the time when Gerasi had uh, synthesized this first commercially viable progestin, so in March 1951, Margaret Sanger, um, which is known to this day, uh, is a very famous activist, nurse, and birth control advocate. So Margaret Sanger and Dr. Abraham Stone visited this guy called Dr. Gregory Pincus, who was a researcher and founder at the Worcester Foundation for Experimental Biology in Shrewsbury, Massachusetts. Sandra and Stone were uh, there as representatives of the Sandra Research Bureau of New York. Having learned about Pincus' work in mammalian sexual physiology, Sander recognized that he could be the missing piece, actually, in a project that she, has, she had been working towards um, for decades, the development of a universal oral contraceptive, which is pretty remarkable for, um, for the time. Now, besides having uh, his own research organization, Pincus had ties with Searle, having worked with the pharmaceutical company on the development of other hormonal drugs before. During this meeting in March 1951, Sandra managed to secure Pincus's interest in this endeavor of developing this universal contraceptive. And so the first phase of what would turn out to be a massive research project began. Now, of course, an endeavor like that, developing a medication like that, requires a very substantial financial investment in order to happen. The first round of experiments in this was supported by a relatively modest grant provided by the Planned Parenthood Federation of America, which uh, probably many of you know to this day. In this first phase carried out between 1951 and 1952, Pincus, a biologist named uh, Min Chue Cheng, and a chemist named Anne Merrill, the experiments aimed to investigate whether there was indeed a correlation between hormonal levels and ovulation, as suggested by the work of Hyman, which I mentioned before. Now, despite encouraging results, an attempt to, uh, by, Panko, by Pincus to secure financial support from Searle for further research was unsuccessful. But Sanger at the time was already working on other financing options, very aware that 
this kind of research would probably have trouble in finding funding. In March 1952, so roughly a year after her first meeting with Pincus, Sanger arranged another meeting, this time with her friend Catherine McCormick, an MIT-educated biologist, suffragist, birth control advocate, and heiress to a considerable fortune. McCormick had both the financial means and the interest to offer support, the necessary financial support for Sander and Pincus's endeavor. And furthermore, securing this kind of private funding seemed to be a much safer option given that in the states of Massachusetts, as in many more U.S. states at the time, the dissemination of information about contraception was illegal, as I mentioned before. Sandra then introduced McCormick to Pincus and his Worcester research team, thus securing the necessary funds for the project. In the following years, McCormick remained still the main financial supporter for this birth control pill project. Now, it's not only money that they needed. Having secured this necessary sum uh, to fund further experiments, Pincus now needed to find an appropriate environment to start testing how these hormones would act in the human body. In a conference held that same year in 1952, Pincus for by chance reconnected with an old acquaintance with whom he had previously collaborated, Dr. John Rock, a Catholic physician who was researching infertility at the Free Hospital for Women in Boston. John Rock was very interested in potential uses of hormonal medications to combat infertility. And he had actually conducted already a series of ex experiments exploring the fertility enhancing potential of hormonal medications. The free hospital which he headed, uh, and this is a, a quote from Althorn, attracted many leading gynecologists and functioned as a private research clinic. Furthermore, adding to that also, Rock already had a pool of patients who participated in his clinical trials on infertility and who could, of course, then potentially participate in other trials. In exchange for that, Pincus's project promised to offer useful insights to Rock in his research into therapeutic hormonal treatments for infertility. Now, the project soon, very soon, ran into difficulties. In the very first rounds of human testing, they developed this uh, first version of the pill and tested it in, uh, in a pool of, or in Rock's small pool of patients, at the free clinic, disguising it as treatment for their infertility. The results were encouraging, actually. A good number of those patients became pregnant after going off the pill. However, since these patients had already difficulties to conceive to begin with, uh, let's remember this was a fertility clinic, right? So since these were people who already had difficulties conceiving, um, that of course meant that the results that they had were not entirely conclusive. Now, even so, even um, taking that into account, however, um, this first trial highlighted one important aspect of the medication, which is that the continuous usage of the pill caused menstruation to stop, which was an unintentional feature. They did not expect that to happen, 
but it caused it did cause some distress in many patients. Suppressing menstruation, uh, Rock and Pincus concluded then, was not an acceptable trait for a universal contraceptive. The medications usage regimen was then changed in order to address this issue because there was this perception that um, so-called female body without menstruation was unnatural. So um, in order to address this issue, they decided that instead of being used continuously, the pill could be taken for 20 days, which later became 21 days, followed by a seven-day pause that would result in a withdrawal bleeding similar to menstruation. And this is also something very interesting. When uh, a person is on the pill, the menstruation that they get when they pause is a withdrawal menstruation. It's not, um, it's, it's a withdrawal bleeding. It's uh, not exactly a menstruation in the strict sense of the word, like we, uh, or as we, we expect it or as we know it. Um, so this regimen that they, they created to, to kind of force the body to, to menstruate is a regimen that continues to be used for the administration of most contraceptive pills to this day. And this, uh, this usage design, let's call it, or this um, usage regimen, um, the researchers late argued that, um, that it would allow patients to continue experiencing what they described as a normal menstrual cycle, and this is a, a quote, while taking the pill. And uh, this feature uh, was actually one of the first to be specifically engineered into the medication. Um, and uh, Paul Preciado remarks, uh, as I said in the beginning, uh, this is um, a, a, a usage regimen that allows uh, for the artificial construction, as Paul Preciado describes, the artificial construction of sexual dimorphism by maintaining menstruation as one of the key characteristics of femaleness. And so by doing that, um, they were also able to address uh, certain social anxieties about how body perceived as female should function. And in doing that, of course, the researchers sought to reproduce a specific kind of body, a body that would not trouble dominant versions or dominant narratives of femininity. Now, in spite of these first attempts or these first developments, as I said, uh, Pincus and Rock still needed to, to continue experimenting and continue with the clinical trials. They also needed a population that was exponentially larger in order to test the reliability, the reliability uh, effect that these hormones might have in fertility. And now comes in again Catherine McCormick, the Harris. Catherine McCormick and um, when they were faced with these issues, with the necessity of having access to a large population, um, Catherine McCormick put it quite bluntly. She, uh, she is quoted by um, Arellano and Saip, uh, two historians of Puerto Rico that I can also send to you if you want to. But, oh my God, this is, this is such a quote. So Catherine McCormick, bluntly put it, that they needed a cage of ovulating females to experiment on. Now, by reducing potential trial subjects to ovaries conveniently trapped in a cage, McCormick's statement, I guess, offers us a glance at the beliefs shared by herself, um, Sander and Pincus, and which ultimately guided the, the development of the medication of uh, hormonal birth control. 
Sander was, as I said, a feminist, a suffragist uh, at the time, and uh, truly a remarkable woman. But um, she had been uh, also... So initially, Sander had been a member of the U U.S. American Socialist Party. And uh, one of her arguments there, one of her, uh, her main questions at that time was... Um, that she believed that birth control could be a path to economic development. Um, she argued that, and this is a quote, the world and almost our civilization for the next 25 years is going to depend upon simple, cheap, safe contraceptive to be used in poverty, stricken slums, jungles, and amongst the most ignorant people. This is a, a quote uh, also cited in Alt's Horn. The belief, the same belief was shared by many at the time, and it is it's shared by many to this day, right? As we have um, seen with all the rhetoric around birth control and the climate crisis. And uh, soon enough, McCormick's cage would become indeed a reality. In 1954, Gregory Pincus attended a conference in the island of Puerto Rico, a U.S. colony till this day. While he was there, he realized that the island could offer actually optimal conditions for his ongoing research. It had a relatively stable, if numerous, population, adequate healthcare infrastructure, and many, many clinics and hospitals run by U.S. institutions and personnel. Ugh. So this offered, in a way, particularly having all those clinics being run by, by uh, U.S. personnel, it offered a pretty familiar and comfortable working environment for Pincus, Rock, and their team. And furthermore, on top of that, the strict laws that prohibited the dissemination of information about contraception and therefore created difficulties for the birth control project did not exist in Puerto Rico. So carrying out trials in Massachusetts could potentially, very feasibly, result in the prosecution and incar incarceration of all involved parties. But now a trial site where these preoccupations didn't exist would then be a huge asset, right? Because it would be easier to distribute. Everything would get so much better. In Rock's words, uh, transferring their operation to Puerto Rico would allow them, and this is a quote, to attempt certain experiments which would be difficult in this country. Further cementing the idea of using Puerto Rico as a trial site, the U.S. influence on the island put the U.S. American researchers in a position of privilege, really, um, in relation to the Puerto Rican population that they would be working with. Since the Spanish-American War, Puerto Rico had been under control of the United States. Again, we go with the historical context. So, and even though in 1947 the territory had been granted the right to elect a governor, which, I mean, questionable, some say it somehow shifts um, the, status, um, the status of the island away from that of a traditional colony. Um, but even, even in spite of that, the relationships between the island and the U.S. were still of a colonial nature, and they are still to this day. So even though Puerto Rico um, is a, a small nation, it was at the time devastated by poverty, which was a fact that was widely attributed not to the island's colonial status, 
or to the mismanagement um, or unequal distribution of wealth, but to overpopulation. This narrative was also embraced by U.S. Americans, of course, but also uh, by some Puerto Ricans, such as prominent politician Luis Muñoz Marin. Marin believed that birth control, um, as advocated by Margaret Sanger, was an essential strategy for the economic development of the island. The same logic also had in previous years... In previous years, guided several studies conducted by U.S. institutes in order to assess the impact of overpopulation on the island's economic development. As a result of that, since the 1930s, a series of U.S.-initiated birth control programs had been deployed as attempts to address the perceived problems brought about by excessive population growth. Economic growth and distribution of wealth were, according to Munoz, mere auxiliary stages that needed to be deployed in tandem with programs that addressed the main issue, overpopulation. Now, of course, Marin, uh, Marin Munoz's stance did not go undisputed, right? Um, the island had or has a strong Catholic tradition, um, as well as a simmering nationalist movement. And uh, though guided by different reasons, both of these groups identified Munoz's propositions as a threat to Puerto Rico's national sovereignty and identity. Now, the, the Puerto Rican trials were a pivotal part of the history of contraceptive pills. And they provide such a sobering example on how uh, these different issues are articulated, these different issues that we've been discussing and studying in the past, uh, in the past weeks. Now, the first trial in Puerto Rico, which was in truth a small pilot study, was carried out with volunteer U.S. American medical students at the University of Puerto Rico Medical School. The guidelines that the students needed to follow in order for the study to be considered satisfactory were quite strict and included, and this is a quote, taking daily temperature and vaginal smears, collecting urine samples and submission to an endometrial biopsy. Getting students to follow these conditions in a way that, that was satisfactory to the researchers was uh, not very easy. And actually many of the students dropped out because, I mean, you can imagine the also very invasive nature of these trials. And despite being having previously been assured that they would suffer no retaliation if they chose to do so, it appears that many students did have their grades affected by their decision to quit the project, whom they observed, uh, whom that was there they observed were medically trained and sophisticated, um, did not, oh my god, I'm, I'm, I'm mixing things up, sorry, I, I totally mangled this sentence, but um, what I wanted to say is that um, Ultimately, Pinkerton Rock, uh, also, I'm very tired, so I just, like, spaced out for a second. Um, so, again, um, ultimately, Pinkerton Rock considered that the, the participants in this first test, um, who they considered, uh, or they, 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 noted, they note in their papers, were medically trained and sophisticated, they did not represent adequately the population that would use uh, universal contraceptive medication. So following this first incomplete study, Pincus decided to carry out another small trial at the Worcester State Hospital, which was a mental institution. The subjects of this trial were both male and female, and all suffered from varying degrees of psychosis. This was the only instance where the hormonal medication was tested on men. 
The side effects were considered too significant for further testing to be beneficial, and the patient's psychological health was not conducive to participation in uh, extensive clinical tests. And uh, this part, I think it also says a lot about um, another thing that we haven't uh, discussed up until now, but it says a lot about ableism, about um, the institutionalization and, and incarceration, uh, let's say it, of, uh, of differently abled people or uh, neuroatypical people. So um, ultimately, uh, Aldshorn remarks that these difficulties in the test um, led to inc inconclusive results. Now, back in Puerto Rico, they decided to conduct another clinical trial on inmates at the Women's Correctional Institute, which was a prison in the municipality of Vega Baja. Once again, this trial had to be concluded prematurely uh, because the inmates' objections to the experiment and its requirements were strong enough for it to become a liability to the prison's discipline, as historian of medicine Laura Marks, remar uh, Laura Marks notes. Laura Marks remarks, this is terrible. Um, Laura Marks notes in the paper that you, you read. Um, and I think this uh, here we can also uh, make a note of another kind of disciplinary enclosure, right? Um, we have the mental hospital, we have the prison, how these disciplinary enclosures and the people that they that were incarcerated um, within those, they were, um, they were used as tests unwillingly in ways that were absolutely outside of any, um, any uh, code of ethics in medicine. And uh, it also, I think, um, offers further facets or further observations on our discussion on biopolitics and uh, on our discussion on subjectivity, subjects that are, are seen as disposable, less valued, and so on. So, continuing... Um, in spite, oh my God, this is going to be so long. I still have to say so much. I'm sorry. This is going to be a little bit, definitely a little bit longer than our previous classes. So in spite of these initial failures, Pincus and Rock eventually encountered favor favorable conditions for the medication's first large-scale trial. In 1956, they established a partnership with Dr. Idris Rice Ray, a U.S. American physician and medical director of the Puerto Rican Family Planning Association, who had extensive experiment, experience in contraceptive work. Dr. Rice Ray brought not only expertise to the project, but also necessary contacts and points of access to local communities, something that had actually been sorely lacking up until that point. It is through Rice Ray's contacts that finally the project was able to negotiate access to the community of Rio Piedras in the suburbs of the capital, San Juan. At the time, the community was undergoing a few changes with a large new public housing project being erected in the neighborhood as part of um, slum clearance efforts by the, the mayor's office. The families selected by the government to reside in these new buildings uh, considered themselves very lucky and had no intention to leave, most importantly. This means um, this would then allow the, the researchers undisturbed access to these patients which is an issue that plagued the first trials where patient dropout was a recurring concern. The Rio Piedras community constituted then a sizable, stable, and reliable pool of trial subjects. The patients had already participated in trials for other birth control methods, 
and were known, and this is also from the Marx paper, were known to be keen for an alternative means of contraception. Most of these patients had large families with multiple, multiple children to support and very small salaries. They were all under 40 years old and had to be prepared to have another child in case the contraceptive medication failed. Many of those patients were illiterate or almost so. And so the first large-scale contraceptive pill trials began with 100 participants in total. In order to participate in the trial, the patients were first submitted to a series of tests to um, ascertain their health status. Um, since throughout the early trials phase, compliance had emerged as a pivotal issue, the researchers also began attempts to enforce usage through a number of different strategies. Um, they had, you know, of course, a, 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 I guess, a legitimate concern that justified um, their attempts to, to, to try to make sure that the, the pill was used as correctly as possible in order to, to understand, right, um, to understand its effects. I mean, the possibility of uh, that incorrect usage would result in skewed results was uh, significant. So until that point, patients had exhibited a, a certain degree of difficulty following the intake schedule intended by the researchers, which was relatively unusual at the time, and particularly to a population that was dramatically underserved in terms of healthcare. So in an attempt to address this issue, the researchers established through uh, Dr. Rice Ray's context, uh, contacts a partnership with local social workers. So each trial volunteer was given a month's supply of pills at a time. The social workers were responsible for accompanying the patients, providing a new bottle of pills every at the end of um, each month. And they were also responsible for monitoring usage, possible side effects, and health indicators. Now, making the system work was much more complicated than it had seemed in theory, actually, when, it, when push came to shove. The study's earliest stages was, were actually plagued by media campaigns deployed against the pill and patient dropouts caused by the intensity of the side effects and also difficulties communicating with the patients due to the researchers' obliviousness to, to the cultural and social conditions of that place. Furthermore, at times, the patient would not be home when the social worker dropped by. And this could potentially lead to incorrect pill intake. Let's, rem let's remember that the pill is a medication that only works if you take it regularly, if you take it every day. So, therefore, as another way to try to address that, the researchers distributed to the volunteers a pamphlet describing how to correctly use the pill, which was a faulty strategy in the end, because uh, as, I, as I mentioned, um, a lot of those people were either unable to read or had very, very limited reading skills. So um, that uh, pamphlet strategy, of course, assumed that they would either, either be able to read or that they would have access to someone who could. So. Let's take a step back perhaps now and, and think that an analysis of this history of the pill that we're talking about and the structures that made its development possible has to take into account the colonial relations between the United States and Puerto Rico. Even if unwittingly or unintentionally, which I don't think um, is the case, but the biopolitical imbalance between researchers and volunteers informed the dynamics of the trials. And this is evident, for instance, in, in how Pincus and Rock uh, 
dismissed the volunteers' complaints about side effects resulting from the pills, from, from um, pill intake, as, and this is a quote, results of the emotional superactivity of Puerto Rican women, which is another way of saying that they were hysterical. And also let's let's uh let's remember a lot of people the side effects were so intense that a lot of people dropped out of the trials so this distrust of the volunteers complaints reads like an almost i mean almost a literal illustration of the colonizers perception of the subjectivity of the colonized and racialized subject that franz fanon which uh, we also engage with previously describes. Fanon says that in the colonial world, the emotional sensitivity of the native is kept on the surface of the skin like an open sore, which flinches from the caustic agents. And the psyche shrinks back, obliterates itself, and finds outlet in muscular demonstrations that have caused certain very wise men to say that the native is a hysterical type. And yet, even though we have all of this, some scholars still disagree with this reading that I just gave you, that colonial relations influenced the pill trials and the degree of enforcement to which these volunteers were subjected. Outshorn, and this, uh, this bothers me a bit, Outshorn kind of attempts to justify Rock and Pincus's uh, completely unethical experiments, arguing that informed consent procedures were at the time um, in medicine, in international medicine or in international uh, standards of medicine, were still incipient. However, I would like to point out that the lack of these guidelines seldom led um, scientists and physicians to experiment with social groups who held economic, social, cultural, and political power, which is another way of saying they did not experiment on wealthy white people. Disenfranchised and marginalized groups, such as those Pincus and Rock experimented on people in prisons, people in mental health hospitals, people who were poor, living in social housing projects. These people were and continued to be the ones that most need the protection granted by informed consent procedures and ethical guidelines for clinical trials. And Marx, now I'm going to, to go uh, a little bit more, uh, to engage a little bit more with that paper, but Marx seems particularly invested in denying any ill intentions on the researchers' part during these trials. And she argues that the original developers of the pill have been unfairly accused of experimenting on women as though they were guinea pigs. The very trial process could not have worked without the full cooperation of women. Unlike animals, women could not be caged and watched constantly once given certain compounds. It would also be wrong to see the clinical trials of the pill as directed at the most vulnerable impover impoverished groups of women of the third world. As we have seen, trials were conducted on women from a variety of locations and class backgrounds. Now, what Marx's analysis here for, fails to account for is that although the people involved in the Puerto Rican trials did indeed cooperate there are a number of factors behind that decision. Many of these were mentioned by Marx herself in that paper, um, such as, for instance, um, many of these um, many of these people uh, of these women had already many children. Um, they were living in poverty, and the only tangible and supposedly trustworthy alternative to the drug offered by these researchers was surgical sterilization. So presuming that the decision to participate in the study was unrelated to the conditions in which these people and their families were living is disingenuous at best. Framing the choice of environment where disenfranchised subjects could be easily found 
such as prisons and mental hospitals as merely due to the legal and financial concerns erases the ways in which these people marked as colonial subjects, marked as inferior under patriarchy, under um, um, ableism, uh, under uh, uh, coloniality, under um, um, capitalism. Um, so it erases the ways in which these people were exploited for the benefit of, of their uh, imperialist neighbors. Um, Preciado remarks that Puerto Rico, in the end, was, and this is a quote, the invisible factory behind the Playboy mansion and the white, liberated, middle-class American housewife. Now, with the conclusion of, this trial, of these trials and the approval of the uh, of the birth control pill as a commercial as a commercial medication. In May 1960, finally, a medication named Inovid was approved by, um, as I said, by the United States Food and Drug Administration to be marketed and sold as a contraceptive. The drug's formulation included the synthetic hormone North norethinodrel the progestin the progestine produced by cell as well as a small dose of a synthetic estrogen at the time of the puerto rican drug trials that preceded the commercial release of inovid both cell and syntex had developed viable synthetic progestines and here we're going uh, a little bit back to that introduction that i mentioned um, i would explain a little bit better so some of the reasons that led Pincus and Rock to choose one hormone over the other were also offer, I think, very interesting insights into um, the, the biopolitical processes that permeated the development of the birth control pill. Um, Altshorn attributes the preference given to Searle's product instead of Syntex um, to the fact that Pincus um, had previously worked with the company. Marx argues that norethinodrol offered better control of menstruation and breakthrough bleeding in comparison to um, norethisterone developed by Syntex. Now, both Marx and uh, Arejano and Saip, um, whose book uh, about birth control and clinical trials and Catholicism in Puerto Rico is also extremely interesting. Um, but both Marx and Alejandro and Saip, um, however, raise an interesting point. During the animal testing phase, um, Syntex's hormone had been found by Pincus and his team to have slightly androgenic effects. Indeed, um, uh, other researchers, such as Campos et al., uh, Maguire and al., independently confirm these findings, citing acne and the negative impact on lipid metabolism, that is, weight gain, as evidence, and uh, or as evidence um, of these uh, these um, bad side effects. Though um, Maguire actually is careful to note also that hormonal dosage needs to be quite high in order to produce uh, these effects. Norethinodrel, in contrast, had estrogenic effects, which the researchers found preferable. Though the pill had been in use since 1967, due to the restricted laws on contraception throughout the United States, it had been initially advertised as a medication for menstrual disorders. Now, whereas the pill is often remembered for this association with the sexual revolution and so on, on of the 60s and 70s, this perspective, of course, only offers a very, very narrow glimpse into the, the massive and far-reaching implications of a medication like that or of the development of a medication like that. The history of hormonal contraception is fundamentally entangled with that of biopolitical colonial domination. 
Um, ooh, I'm getting tired. So from Mexican campesinos uh, held in indentured servitude, as we talked about during the Barbasco trade, two Puerto Rican patients kept unaware of the risks that participating in the trial entailed, there is a consistent genealogy of subjects that have been exploited throughout the development of hormonal contraception. Other forms of contraception have also been deployed for similar means. Um, actually, if you look at the history of that, Elise Young, for instance, mentions that between 1930 and 1957, women in Palestine were used as test subjects in the initial stages, or Palestinian women, let's uh, make it more clear, were used as test subjects in the initial stages of development of the intrauterine device, the IUD. And Young uh, describes experimentation on women's bodies as, uh, this is a quote, an aspect of colonization carried out through dom the domestication of women through control of their reproduction. She also goes, out, uh, goes on to uh, discuss the instrumentalization of medical science for constructing sex and race in the occupied region, thus subsuming female, uh, and this is again a quote, thus subsuming female identity under biological cycles and reproduction and characterizing Arabs or, scare quote, Orientals as, like women, by nature, deficient in character, passive, backward, irrational, and incapable of taking control over their own health. Additionally, Hayes, uh, another paper that I gave you to read, also exposes the widespread distribution of Norplant, a contraceptive implant, in 1980s Brazil as a disguised implantation strategy for a medical device that had not yet been thoroughly tested. Now, uh, oof. as I said, God, I I'm sorry, I'm tired. As I said, um, of course, it might be tempting to kind of construe all of this argument and all of this um, conversation linking, linking the development of birth control pills to colonialism as some sort of crusade against the medication. Um, the issue is much more complex than that. Contraceptive technologies have, without doubt, had a positive and ongoing impact uh, for many. This historical review that I gave you today is um, an attempt to, to kind of trace the relations between contraceptive technologies realized in this figure of the pill and questions uh, or ongoing interrogation on biopolitics and colonialism. And it's also meant to give us um, a place to start, let's say, for the next phases of our class, where we are going to start discussing questions of population control um, and the, um, the establishment of population as a managerial category and um, uh, the understanding of scarcity uh, as uh, and all those questions. But for now, I think. I have actually gone um, way over the usual hour that I try to keep to. So I will now stop. I also, um, this week I didn't give you any, just a, also a remark, this week I didn't give you any artwork as a, a reference or as a starting point for discussions. Um, uh, on our, our theory parts because um, there has been way too much going on in the world right now um, as you must all know and uh, I think a lot of the things that I talked about today that I talked about here um, have also very direct links to the ongoing genocide of, um, of the black population in the United States and uh, um, 
and also, of course, of indigenous peoples. And I guess um, it's a conversation that we can um, continue having, like we had last week. All of these questions are uh, indeed related to uh, to who gets to access uh, healthcare, who gets to uh, to be allowed to live. Um, so anyway, I'll have to um, go now. Thank you so much for watching until the end. Um, this longer class and I'm looking forward to continue tomorrow. So see you. <laughs>